So we're here for Kitchen Hacks, and it's, it was funny, when we were brainstorming for this class, we realized we could take it in a few different directions. Um, but we build it as a class that's sharing all different types of tics, tips and tricks for saving time, increasing the quality of recipes and improving their performance, and minimizing equipment and eliminating single-use gadgets. So, yeah, because I can't handle those things, right? Who needs that stuff cluttering up your drawer? Um, I'm Meredith, by the way, and work for Living Web Farms. This is Patrick Battle, he's the director. And we're just offering year-round classes. We have some schedules here today if anybody hasn't seen the full menu um, of what we're offering this year. You can check that out, take one with you. Um, go online, register for anything at any point. And we're covering topics from cooking to alternative energy to um, gardening, farming, homesteading. Medicinal herbs. Medicinal herbs. Yep. So if there's any way that it has to do with having a saner, more sustainable future. We got it. Of all the places I could go with this class, I wanted to try and narrow it down to the most helpful things that I've adopted in my own kitchen. Um, and so hopefully they'll be helpful to you as well. For me, I think number one, um, having a well-stocked pantry is the biggest time saver for me. And if you're at this class, you're probably somebody who already has a pretty well-stocked pantry, but I just wanted to share with you quickly like some of the stuff that, and we're gonna get into recipe science in a second, but once you understand recipe science a little bit more, if you have you know, certain categories of things in your pantry, you can pretty much go anywhere. Um, and actually somebody in an interview recently asked me if you were stranded on a desert island and you could only take 10 ingredients, what would they be? And the first one was salt. Um, <laughs> to absolutely you have, have salt. Ocean. Yeah, that's true. Um, some type of fats, and I know we have some vegetarians in the audience, so um, that may not be animal fat, but it may be some other type of fat, your coconut oil, um, your olive oil, etc. cetera. Um, acids, I find them totally overlooked in most home kitchens. We're talking about citrus. Citrus is huge in my kitchen. Um, vinegars, various vinegars, um, and cultured dairy products can act as acid ingredients as well, like buttermilk and yogurt. Grains and legumes, a variety of them. Um, cheeses, if you eat cheeses. Um, if you don't, you can make nut cheeses. So I have nuts on hand. Herbs of all kinds, including fresh ones in the garden out back. Um, spices, whole, we'll talk about that later. Um, fresh produce, of course. And then, you know, you need spare sweeteners and leaveners for making some of the chemistry work, and especially in baking um, and sauce making. And then, you know, extra things might be your binders, which are things that make, give the recipes a stick to itiveness. And so those are your eggs, mustard as a binder, parsley, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Milk products are binders. Um, gelatin, if you eat meat, comes from collagen, that's bones, skin, hair, and teeth. Um, if you don't, um, seaweed can be a source of hydrocolloid binder, so um, agar-agar is an example of that. Um, and then obviously gums, a lot of people avoid gums for digestive issues, but uh, you know, certain guar gums and gums like that can be used for binding. And so that's kind of an overview, I guess, of the categories of things. And then within those categories, obviously, you have the whole grocery and market to choose from. You know, if you have all those things on hand, you're going to automatically save time when you're ready to cook something. From there, I think it's really key to move away from recipes, and this is something we're really emphasizing in our cooking instruction at Living Web, moving away from recipes and more towards ratios, and understanding that all cooking is fundamentally understanding the relationship of one ingredient to another within recipes in order to make what you want to make. And once you move from recipes to understanding ratios, you will inevitably move away from measuring devices into weights in general. And that's going to minimize equipment at the same time. Um, and it sounds a little daunting at first, but it gives you unlimited creativity in terms of what you're doing. So if I want to make bread, um, I can go online and I can find 15 million different recipes for bread. But if I know that all good bread is generally five parts flour to three parts water, plus a yeast and salt, I can make a good loaf of bread. And that's five parts flour to three parts water by weight. Another great example I like to give is a cookie. A cookie is one part sugar, two parts fat, three parts flour, one, two, three. If you took away the sugar, you would have roux, flour and liquid. If you took away the flour, you would have icing, sugar and fat, right? So all the different components and the way they interplay together and at the different ratios, determine what you're eventually making. For example, a pancake, two parts liquid, one part egg, two parts flour, whereas a crepe, one part liquid, one part egg, half part flour. It's a thinner batter, right? So there's a great book called Ratio. It's by Michael Ruhlman. 
R-U-H-L-M-A-N. And it gives a lot of these ratios and it talks about the principles behind them. And gaining an understanding of that, while it forces your brain to work mathematically in ways that it's maybe not accustomed to in the kitchen, once you master that and understand it, you can really just tweak, you know, pound cake to sponge cake, sponge cake to angel food cake, pretty reasonably, and you kind of understand how, you know, creaming butter and eggs together versus foaming sugar and eggs together, and what that does ultimately to the end recipe. Yeah. What if you want to substitute a liquid sweetener for sugar, like maple syrup or something like that? How would you not use a recipe to adapt that? Well, I think it just depends on what you're doing. And so you're we- making a cookie. Right. Um, well, it kind of depends on what you're doing because sugar, I mean, sugar is a bulking agent as well as it is a sweetener. So in some recipes, it simply doesn't work to add a liquid sweetener and still get the same effect like in a cookie or a freestanding baked good. Um, do you have thoughts on like tweaking, just like a general rule for tweaking ratios for alternative well, sweeteners? What I recommend is if you, if you aren't confident, then try it once with the sugar, see what the thing looks like and then just adjust the flour and liquid to get it to look similar. Right. And you'll come pretty close. And yeah. you can also use additional binders, right? So you may choose to use additional leaveners and binders to create the fluff that you want while the seasoning or the sweetening can be using whatever agent you choose. I've seen some recipes that use a liquid sweetener, mm -hmm. but sometimes I see a recipe that uses sugar that I like to adapt. You like to adapt. You know, I've been doing that for 40 years and just winging it and it's worked fine. Usually using honey and syrup, is that what you're substituting? Mostly. Yeah. Syrup, yeah. One thing I do too is I tend to reduce the sweetener anyways, and then I know honey is stronger right. in sweetness anyway, so I don't need that much so it doesn't throw the recipe that far off. Mm -hmm. If it feels dry to me, I'll add a little bit more liquid. If it feels wet to me, I'll add a little bit more. But that's why it's nice to have some familiarity with what the dough is supposed to look like, <coughs> you know. Right. With, with sugar once anyways. Yeah. yeah, and also playing around with air. Like if you whip more air into a batter, um, then you may be able to create, you know, a leavening effect that way or a bulking effect that way mm -hmm. and not rely so much on a, on a refined sugar in that example. I think that would be another alternative. Yeah. you go over the pancake and crepe ratio? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pancake is two parts liquid, one part egg, two parts flour. So it's relatively equal flour to liquid, and then it usually always has a little bit less egg, whereas a crepe is gonna be equal parts egg to liquid, one part liquid, one part egg, and only a half part flour. So I thought maybe it would be good to um, go from ratios to bread, since okay. that's sort of your sure. milieu, and you can... And this is one of those ratios. Why did I learn the recipe? I had a bread machine. It was the same recipe all the time. Though I, what I always do with bread, and this isn't a bread class, it's just some tips about how to be, if you're doing bread, how to make it work better, is I end up making it wetter than the recipe would probably come out if you did it the way most Americans do, which is knead it until it feels comfortable for you to knead it. Whereas if you stay in the discomfort zone, you keep it a little wetter, you get a better bread. Um, the point of this actually was not so much to talk about the recipe. The recipe for this is very standard. It's two cups of water, four cups of flour, two teaspoons of salt. I added some oil to this to make it a little easier to do, and I just did half that recipe because I didn't want to have a lot of dough when I was left. What I really want to do with this dough is teach you a couple principles about how to get a dough to develop. And one of the best ones, it's a great secret, it's got a fancy term, it's called autolyzing, okay? And it's simply to mix the water and the flour together and let it sit. Let it sit for 10, 15 minutes, and the gluten starts to align itself. You don't have to knead it to align it. Then, this is actually great if you're going to be home all day, but don't have much time to make bread. You can simply come around and give it a quick knead or fold. I'm kind of folding more here to keep my hands clean. I want everybody to feel it, because really the point of this is to give you a feel for how a dough feels before the gluten is developed. So go ahead and just push it in. So, yeah, just more like this. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you're going to learn that that's, that's what I'm going to be showing is this, this technique. So it's a push in. Okay. So when it comes back to you? When it comes back to you really fast, the gluten is developed. What happens on the other end, when you want to know if it's ready to bake, you can push it pretty hard here. You see it doesn't come back, right? Mm -hmm. so I give it a good whack, okay? okay? On the other end, you wet your finger, because you can get a false read otherwise, because it'll stick to the dough, and you 
very, very, very gently push it in. Because it's full of air, and if you push it too hard, it's going to collapse, and you want to put it in the oven. Mm. And what should happen, if it's ready, is it should barely come back incredibly slowly. If you're on the edge and, like, playing with it, and maybe going to lose it in the oven, but might have a spectacularly high loaf, it won't come back at all. Mm. Yeah. If when you push it in very gently, it collapses, you overproofed it. And it's time <laughs> to re- So you put your yeast in with your water and then your bottle? Um, you know, it doesn't matter at all. You know, but the books all say to proof the yeast. Yeah, if you, if you doubt your yeast, and the proof is a baker's term, it means rise. No, okay? I know. If yeah. you doubt your yeast, then go ahead and proof it. But I worked at a um, the croissant bakery, and we just put all the ingredients in, turned the mix around. Didn't matter at all. Okay, so now we're going to show you how it responds to kneading and how you can tell that you're done and you don't have to knead it anymore. So what about punching down the dough? I thought writers were supposed to do that. It's not like well, actually, and like punching down is an old, um, like, American technique. But the superior technique is to fold it. You make a much stronger dough, instead of punching it down, you kind of just deflate it and fold it on itself. It makes it much stronger. Okay, so now, see how it's coming back a lot faster? Mm. Yeah. I didn't want you to push it in, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. I get the idea. Yeah. Okay, so now, I don't think I need it anymore just to show you. Why this kneading is so fast is because it sat all the way coming up here. And even though it had the salt and stuff in it, it still had that time to develop on its own. Time can eliminate 90% of your kneading. Now, the other thing I know is that I couldn't walk here and have you do this without getting a false read. It has to be you stop kneading immediately and hit it immediately. So be ready to whack it with your hand the minute <laughs> I stop, okay? On your toes, just poke it. Yep. See how quick oh, it comes yeah. back? Yeah. See, I can't just do I have to actually knead it again or you yeah. won't get the same read. Okay. That's how quickly it changes, go ahead. See how quickly oh, it yes, comes back? Yes, yes. <laughs> so that's how you tell that you're there and you can stop the minute you get that response. And you don't need, no pun intended, to, um, <laughs> to do very much kneading. See how quick? Oh, wow. Go ahead. I think that will still happen. It really came back. I love all the reactions. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Oh, yeah. But by now, i got to knead it again because you've got a false read. Now that we're just going to let this sit, and at the, towards the end of the class, when I think it's well risen, we'll come by and we'll gently hit it. After we wet our fingers, go ahead. See the difference? Oh, yeah. 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 That's how you tell. Your gluten's developed when it comes back that fast. It's some come back so fast that you can hardly see it coming back. You know, if it's coming back slower than that, you gotta need it a little more. Hmm. That's that's all there is to it. That's cool, Pat. Um, the other thing I want to teach you about that, and my hand would be a good example. If you, this was a sourdough starter, and I wanted to keep that sourdough starter, but I was me, who <coughs> loses track of things and has too many things going on. So I dig it out of the fridge months later and it's an interesting pink color and I think, no, I'm not going to use that. That can go in the compost mm -hmm. pile. <laughs> what I want to do instead is when I'm done, if this was a sourdough, and actually I wouldn't even do it with the dough because the salt would weaken it. I would actually first put the starter in, you know, and then maybe purposely smear some of it up on top of the bowl and then just let it dry there. And once it was dried or like dry on my hand, right, I would scrape it off onto a paper plate or something and let it dry thoroughly. Totally dry, so it snaps, right? Mm. And then when it's totally dry, you can put it in the freezer and it'll be almost like new when you get it out. If you freeze it when it's got water in it, like a lot of things when they freeze when they have water in it, it ruptures most of the life and it dies and it doesn't hold. But if you freeze it once it's dry... And then what would they do with it when they got it out of the freezer? You get it out of the thing. You would probably, I would probably give it two days or something to be sure that you had it ready if you were counting on it, you know? Um, I would take it out and I would add it to some water and flour, and actually you are gonna talk about saving pasta water. Mm -hmm. And pasta water and potato water are the very best for starters because your starter is a community of microbes. And in that community, there's things that like protein and there's things that like starch. Protein is gluten. Gluten gives you the structure of the bread. You get too many protein eaters and you're gonna have a very flat bread. But if they eat the starch, you don't care. They made a lot of gas, it rises high. And, and so that, out leads into what types of flour to use for your starter. Can you talk about that? Yeah, totally. The, the, starter, the starters, once again, don't want the high protein flours. They want either pastry or unbleached or um, whole wheat um, all purpose. 
and rye. Rye is actually spectacular. It just ferments really wonderfully. Doesn't have hardly any gluten in it, which is the protein. So it makes the very best starter. Even if you're going to make your breads with other flours, rye is actually the, probably the best for making a starter to get it really strong and healthy. Um, it's harder to make a good bread with rye. I'm not saying you should try and make your bread with rye unless you come to one of our bread classes. <laughs> or read a book, but it's hard to do that. But as far as getting the starter strong, it loves the rye. You know? And then just keep you know, feeding it with potato water or um, pasta water. If you have it, don't like not build your starter because you don't have that water. Regular water is fine. Mm. But if you have that, it just makes it better. Most people know that the way to tell the bread's done is by knocking on the bottom if it sounds hollow. That's a great technique, and I got very good at it when I had my bakery. But every once in a while, I get it wrong, and it wouldn't be done. <laughs> and you can't rebake bread, and I would have a batch of bread that I couldn't sell. Very rare, but just distracted or something, right? If you want to be absolutely certain, meat thermometer, slide it in. When it hits 200, it's absolutely done. If you want it to be crispy, like a baguette, I wouldn't bother making a big loaf this way, but for a baguette, you can let it go to 210. And then it'll be done, and it's crispy, and not worth eating after half a day. Because it'll be deadly. You know? <laughs> okay, that's it. That's fresh. Cool. The only other thing I wanted to say about ratios is that once my brain started thinking in that way, it's totally changed my relationship with the recipes because now I read them almost like stories, you know, like I'm looking through a cookbook and I'm looking at the recipes for ideas and cool flavor pairings, but I'm also like always paying attention to the relationship between ingredients. Where am I seeing patterns, you know, and where is it a little bit different from a ratio I've seen before? And do I want to try that or, you know, whatever, how do I want to tweak my rigmarole? I wanted to share three of my favorite make ahead recipe enhancers. Just one more note on saving time and then we can move on to some of the fun like do this to whatever, peel your garlic or whatever. First for me is the quick pickle. Um, just mastering, well, I mean, I ferment a lot. I'd rather ferment any day than make a vinegar pickle. But if you're in a hurry, um, you can make a pickle really easily of pretty much anything with about, per, for about a pint, that's like a third vinegar to the rest water. And you can do more vinegar if you like it, a more of a kick. And then if you want a sweet pickle, a couple teaspoons of sugar. If you don't want a sweet pickle, a couple teaspoons of salt. And you'll boil that mixture together, put all your veggies or whatnot in a jar, and then pour just the just boiling brine over top of it, put a lid on it, let it cool, and you've got a, you've got a quick pickle, you know? And so that's Pickles are just a great way. I mean, if you chop them up and put them in salads, if you just put them on the side of a plate, I think they're a really great way to enhance any recipe. Um, and when we do our cultures class, which we're gonna have to reschedule because it got, some of you were signed up for it, I think. Um, it's about capturing wild cultures. We'll talk about ways to use wild fermentation to get really quick pickles as well, which is super fun. Um, the other thing that I love is a compound butter. So that's basically just taking butter, or if you're not eating dairy, uh, you could use a vegan butter or a Earth Balance stick or something. And I, actually there's a recipe that I can supply if you're interested in a homemade vegan butter that's excellent. You could even do it with coconut oil. Soften the coconut oil, soften the butter, and then just add herbs and seasonings and salt you know, to taste. One of my favorite ones is just garlic, lemon, maybe a little bit of parsley, salt and pepper. And then you'll re-solidify, you know, blend it up, food processor, just, you know, with your hands um, or some spoons. And then I usually just form it into a log and I'll either freeze it or re-harden in the refrigerator. And then I can cut off slices whenever, throw them in the pot and I can saute using that or I can, you know, roast something, slide that compound butter over the top of it. Um, and it's just an awesome way to save time and add a really big punch of flavor. The other thing I do is I make stock every single week using stock. Just a veggie stock, or if I have, you know, if I have meat trimmings that I want to put in it, I will, but it's totally just optional. Um, and what I'm doing is like every trim, everything I cut is coming, all these papers are coming, potato skins. If I bake potatoes, I'm putting the cooked skins in there. I'm putting onion skins in there. And I mean, if you go to culinary school, you know, the litany is clarify, clarify, clarify. But when you're at home and you're just using stocks to flavor, they don't have to be clear. They can be rich browns and, you know, cool mahogany colors from your onion skins and, you know, the ends of your vegetables. And this way you're really not wasting perfectly good items. You know, once they've been boiled down to make stock, they can go in your worm bin or your compost or, you know, 
give them to the geese. Well, <laughs> the highest onions. concentration of quercetin, which is really good for us, is on onions and it's in right. the skins. That's right. And sometimes putting a lot of onion skins can make it really bitter. Yeah, you gotta be careful. So you gotta be careful. But um, I make about a gallon a week and then I'll keep a quart out in the fridge to use in the next week's cooking, either for boiling grains or braising greens, and then whatever uh, above that quart I am freezing. Another great thing in a veggie stock is cheese rinds. If you're buying washed rind cheeses or you know hard cheeses, you can cut them, eat them, save the rinds in your little stock bucket in the fridge and put them, it makes for a really rich and flavorful veggie stock. Um, we call them cheese bones at my house, um, just put them in. I also make food for my cat, so I'll use some of the stock in that um, as well. Um, so that's, those are my three favorite make-aheads. Do you have make-aheads that you well, love? I make a lot of dressing and I use that sometimes just to yeah. like flavor beans and stuff, you know. But another one that I will sometimes do is if I have to make a marinade for something, I'll make enough that I can have it for a while. Yeah, anything you're making, make more than what you need. If you have, you know, if you're toasting nuts, toast more, you know, um, because it never hurts to have extras. Then if you toast it the nuts, is it necessary to keep it in the fridge after it's toasted? Or? I would keep it in the freezer depending on how long you need to keep them. You've already begun to denature the oils by toasting them, so then you want to stop it right there so it doesn't keep going. So put it in the freezer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Any other make-aheads for you? I don't tend to do them as yeah. much. Yeah. The other thing I do is just a lot of oh, fermenting. Tons of pesto, of course. Pesto, yeah. <laughs> Actually, and you can make pesto out of anything, right? Like it doesn't have to be basil. So we did one in a class one time that was like radish tops and fennel tops and, you know. Arugula. Yeah, arugula makes great. Or garlic scapes, you can make great, um, you know, collard stems or broccoli stalks. I mean, anything you want. And there's, I think that Maybe that's a different handout. That's the foods you should be making from scratch handout, which I can provide to anybody here, but it's got, it's got pesto recipe and it's also got the um, vegan butter recipe. I saw one restaurant was doing a sun-dried pesto over fettuccine. Interesting, it does sound good. Well, I, I basically use basil, and I actually don't even really make what's simply called pesto. I simply blend up olive oil with, with basil. And I use as little oil as possible and get as much basil blended up without killing my machine. Right. And then I freeze it, and when I want to use it, I pull it out and I grate off what I want. Yeah, that's a great idea. Then, grate off the cheese? Grate off, off the pesto. Oh, oh, oh. So it's like, I always have fresh basil. I don't really, I brought dried basil this time, but I tend not to use dry basil because I always have the equivalent of fresh basil in my freezer. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good idea. You, you could put it in iceberg. ice cube trays. You could put it in an ice cube tray. Yeah, but then that ice cube tray is dedicated or takes a lot of washing. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. so if you don't mind the flavor of basil, which is kind of nice, you know. He's saying basically he's blending basil into as much olive oil as possible. And you're freezing it in I use kind of form? I use yogurt containers because it's easy to kind of pop those okay, together and come so out. Okay, so about like so. Yeah, that's what I do. But, I mean, it doesn't really matter. It could be any size you want. Because you know? I use these um, the yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for stock. Great. Right? Mm -hmm. Because there's just the two of us, mm -hmm. so it's often like two It's a cups. nice small quantity. Perfect. But you want to be very careful not to put that stock in hot, right? No, I let it cool, cool. down. Then you put it, then you let it cool mm -hmm. down, then you put it in the freezer. That's right. And we, you know, this is just flour, but... There's an argument to be made that we should be careful about using recycled plastic because it isn't necessarily stable. And I'm so like, old, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if your grandkids are coming around. You know, <laughs> and indeed, I've stopped throwing them in the dishwasher, not that I use it very yeah. often, because they're not designed for that and stuff may no, be coming off. They're really the not designed the, to keep using The Dollar Tree has some nice glass containers. That oh, you really? Glass is superior, yeah. but sometimes it's scary. You know, Pardon? Sometimes it's scary, you know, if, if you're if you're using it a lot in places where you can easily drop it or bang it. I banged it. I banned it from my bakery after somebody dropped it. I just find that it's so heavy. You know, glass is not always practical just for the fact that it's heavy and fragile. You know? Don't let yourself to thoughtless freezing. Mm, right, right, absolutely. Yes, yeah, storage storage is important. I mean, obviously, making ahead and freezing things is limited by what storage you have. So, think about extra storage space if you. Are looking at. I mean, it, it's funny, Kelly Wilkinson, who does a preserving foods without canning class, it's phenomenal. It's on our website. 
she says that she firmly believes everybody should have three months of food available in their home. And she eats a variety of things. And so three months of food in her house might look different from three months of food at your house. But I, I just find that really interesting. She has a lot of storage space, you know, in her house. And it's completely different from how most Americans have their homes organized, you know, but it's worthy of a thought or two, I think. It's probably safe to say that anything you're doing to cook with more whole foods and, um, and along the vein of this whole class is eventually going to save you time, right? So, mm -hmm. but we'll kind of move on from that category. Um, I tried to pick out 10 things that I felt would increase, my 10 favorite things for increasing recipe quality, but I ended up with 11. So, um, one of the things was, and I can maybe combine one and two into one, um, to be buying whole spices um, and really like spices are quickly losing their quality as soon as they're ground. And if you take a spice out of your spice cabinet and you smell it and it doesn't smell like anything, it's not gonna taste like anything. Um, so, uh, and there are certain spices that particularly very quickly will just completely, cumin is like my big thing. It's like, just get rid of that ground cumin. <laughs> it's like pretty much worthless. You, depending on where you get your spices, they may not be very fresh anyway. I mean, the co-op is an excellent place to buy spices. They are constantly restocking and they have very high quality suppliers. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what place did you say? Here, here at the co-op. Oh, the bulk room in the, you know, where you can get teas and spices and stuff, a really great, my favorite place in town to get my spices. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how do you, what do you do with the spices? I just, I would just buy them whole and keep them on hand whole and then grind them as I need them in like an old coffee grinder or a mortar and pestle. And always I'm toasting them first. I think this is a huge way to increase the quality of your recipes. If you have time, taking that whole spice, I use almost exclusively cast iron in my kitchen and it's a great method for toasting whole spices and just letting, as soon as you start smelling them, releasing those aromas, then you can pull them, grind. And you can also grind and then toast too. And some, you know, curries call for that method. I just use a zester for my nutmeg and oftentimes for garlic. I grow my ginger and then I, cause you can grow ginger here. You can grow in pots about this big, five gallon bucket. It's hard to cure in our climate, but you can take the fresh ginger and freeze it. And then I'll pull the frozen ginger out and just grate it on a microplane or a zester. And it's like fresh ginger in my foods without you know going and constantly buying the cured fresh ginger that's imported, right, from the store. Um, even though you said not to use recipes, some recipes I've looked at and said, say like cumin, take the whole cumin and mm -hmm. grind it. And I think, oh God, that's so much time. So I get out my cumin from the cabinet yeah. that's already ground. But like you said, I didn't realize it was losing its potency. Yeah, and like you said, but that's a great point you make. We don't always have time to do everything perfectly, right? So we're not always going to be able to use whole spices or, you know, we might be discouraged in our hurry from using any spice at all if if we know that we have to grind it and we are committed to toasting it. You know, so obviously, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not an absolutist in any way, shape, or form. I say do what works for you. But I think if we're talking about enhancing recipe quality, toasting spices, and also toasting grains. It doesn't matter if you're cooking rice. If you're doing quinoa, you wanna rinse it first and then toast it. That saponin on the outside of the grains is gonna be broken down and it's not gonna be bitter if you toast it. Um, any grain you're cooking, I just give a little toast first. Better. Yeah. Unless More you, digestible. Better flavor. I wondered, would you toast before you lacto ferment it? Do you do that? Um, you could, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't, so that's another time thing for me. Like mm -hmm. sometimes I'm like, oh crap, I didn't soak my grain. You oh know? yeah, well. I don't, and I, and I a lot of sources are saying it, like, yeah. a lot of sources are saying it may not be as necessary for all the grains and, and legumes that we eat, you know, but what he's talking about is like an overnight or at least like a, some smaller, you know, grains and, and legumes need like a three hour, five hour soak in usually water and then like a little bit of yogurt or buttermilk or whey in the water to sort of do like a little bit of an acid breakdown on the phytic acid and like beans and grains and like saponins on quinoa, making them more digestible and well, they'll cook more readily as well. Ensuring that you get the minerals out of the grains. That's right. I soak the rice, but you soak quinoa as well before you? I usually put, a, I usually cook, cook quinoa like a cup at a time and I'll put it in like a coffee filter because it's very fine, right? Put it down a coffee filter and just take and rinse it with the little, the little thing that comes off in sprays from your sink. Give it a rinse in cold water. And then I'll just heat some olive oil in a saucepan and dump it in there until it kind of starts to pop. 
and snap. And then I'm putting in my stock or whatever it is that I want to yeah, cook it in. You're supposed to um, toast the quinoa, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, really lends itself to buckwheat is great okay. toasted. I love chickpeas, just a little bit toasted before I cook them. Um, rice is great toasted. Um, so yeah, just a little bit. And, and, and anytime we're talking about toasting or roasting, like preheating pans, I think is like a super important thing. So get that cast iron or that sheet pan that you're roasting veggies on hot in the oven first. And this is gonna eliminate all the flipping about that you need to do when you're roasting and toasting things. If the pan's already hot, you know, and you're just sort of like, shaking it around a little bit, you're gonna have an easier, more even time heating it through. So a couple questions. Uh -huh. So with the music, add some um, uh, buttermilk to mm -hmm. you know, give it more acid and mm -hmm. you know, help things to break down a little. How much are we talking? Oh, I don't measure it. I usually just do like a dash, yeah. you know, depending on... The most a tablespoon or two. Right. Okay. Some places, okay. short of two tablespoons. Right, especially yeah. for like a home scale quantity. I mean, sometimes we're making navy bean soup for 100 at the farm, and in that case, it would be a lot more. But, you know, it's about a tablespoon or two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so when you're toasting grains, mm -hmm. how, how, when you know to stop? I usually use my, my nose and um, also when they start sort of responding, right? So they're not only releasing aroma, but they're also kind of popping. Obviously you don't want to burn them, so you're watching them too. So I just use my senses, kind of figure it out. It's going to depend on the grain that you're working with. It usually doesn't take very long though. Yeah. Would you toast the rice before you soak it or soak it and then toast? I would probably toast it beforehand because it would be too wet and gummy to really get a good toast on it afterwards. Thank you. Okay, now so, on, on, on fresh herbs, when you dry them, is it best, because I'll use the little coffee grinder, mm -hmm. is it best to just leave them whole um, after they're dried? As whole as you can leave them. The, the less places they're broken, the less places to oxidize. Right. Oil, so and know. also that brings me to storage of herbs and spices. Like I, and I'm guilty of this, to putting them as close to the stove as I can for easy access, but the heat on them is not, it's gonna cause them to volatilize a lot quicker. Also light, especially on those dried leafy herbs, is gonna be really, you know, it's gonna cause them to break down. So you need them in, you know, dark bottles or bags and in a dark cabinet and preferably away from the heat of the stove. Um, any, I keep, I keep flowers in bulk buckets and you know, my kids push them around and stand up on them to get to places. And sometimes I'll find that they push it over right on top of like a heating element, like a heating vent. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, it's like a fresh local flower, you know, that's just like got heat pumping through it. And same thing, it's like, you know, a fresh flower that has color to it has oils in it, you know, and the more you're heating it, the more chance you have of it going south. On the other hand, you can use two-year-old white flower and there's no difference. That's true. <laughs> that don't yeah. I don't do it because I just wanted to point out, I don't, even though it's best practice, and I'm going to blend this up so you can see the difference between what you smell, I don't tend to take the time to run my herbs through the, um, the mill just because of time. But what I do is, I always do, is I just do. Oh, okay. And you get a much finer thing, and that's releasing a lot of oils. It's quick and easy. You know? Let's just blend this up. It's also a really good sensory moment, right? Because the way we're seasoning food, ideally, is we're doing it often throughout the cooking process, and we're doing it based on our smell. And so if you're interacting with it by doing this and it's releasing those aromas into your nose, you can smell what's missing. Um, you can smell if it needs more or less, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, they, they read a recipe and they use that teaspoon of this and the teaspoon of that. And you don't know what the strength of it is. Um, it may be very strong and very fresh and a teaspoon might blow you away. Mm -hmm. Or it might be a year old and you need four times as much to get the flavor. Right. So do it by the smell and then ultimately the taste. There's a really funny story, I don't know if it's true or not, about Einstein like hiring somebody to work with him and he like sat down with a few candidates and you know decided within seconds over lunch who he was going to hire based on the people who tasted their food before they salted it and the people who just automatically reached for the salt shaker and put the salt on their food. And I don't know if that's true, but I think it's an awesome story. So. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to hit this for a moment and then pass it around and you'll see the difference between what you just smelled. Like. I'm guessing you can already start to smell. What is that? That's probably, I think it was basil. Okay. No, no it's marjoram. Marjoram. Yeah, marjoram. I love marjoram. Marjoram's my favorite herb. It is? What do you use? I use it for everything. Yeah, you do? That's right. <laughs> Yours too? 
Oh, it's just, it's got a, uh, it, it's, it's got a savory richness and a sweetness. It's just, yeah. I grew some last year, but I didn't use it that much. I thought, what do I use? Try any for? tomato sauce, any sauce of any sort, really? with eggs. Beans. You can put it in a mayo. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. It's great. I, to me, it lends itself to, like, um, pungent or... Um, Oh, sure. I mean, it's great in beans, but beans to me have a, um, an airier taste. You know, I'm thinking more of like, um, like I use, I mean, I, I use, you're a vegetarian, but I use it a lot with chicken. Um, it, it lends itself really well to dishes with mustard, like that mustard and sort of like the pungent taste of mustard is really good with, with marjoram. Um, I love tarragon. I think that's my oh, I favorite. Tarragon yeah. <laughs> I like tarragon, but I'd like to combine it with, with something acid. With yeah, lemon. yeah, definitely. Yeah, fresh, Maybe that's why I love tarragon flavor. so much because I'm obsessed with citrus. Yeah. Like, I think I was telling you in another cooking class, like, if anything's ever missing, I'm like, well, just put a little lemon in. That'll be fine. <laughs> um, and then it always begs for, but actually, the pie we've yet to eat from the class, the um, Russian vegetable pie, that's a combination of tarragon, marjoram. And dill. And dill. It's got some crazy combos yeah. in it. And it's just like the, the aroma. Didn't it smell amazing when you're, you didn't bake it? I didn't bake it. I was right. just like you ready. It. You got to eat it when it bakes. Okay. The smell is worth everything for the meal. I love it. Yeah. This is one of my favorites. Deglazing pans to make quick sauces. It's an excellent way, one of my favorite ways to enhance a recipe. Even if you're cooking an egg and you're feeling super uncreative, deglaze that pan with a little vinegar afterwards. And that's just taking whatever's stuck to the bottom of the pan, putting some kind of liquid in it. I don't care if it's a little drop of your beer, some water, it probably shouldn't be water, right? It should be something more flavorful than that. A little stock, a little sherry vinegar, something, and then just heating that until you can scrape whatever it is off the bottom and sort of whisk it around in there. You can add a little flour or something if you want to thicken it, and then just drizzle that sauce over what have you, your egg, your piece of tofu, whatever it is. Um, and it just totally enhances. I mean, sauces are like the great enhancers, right? So. Like I have this big obsession with like using the full essence of food or the full essence of the plant. And if you're a grower, then you understand what that means. You understand that when a plant is a baby versus when it's a shoot versus when it's mature versus its seed, all stages of its life, it brings out different characteristics. It brings out different flavors. And so if you're working with a mature plant, like I'm using the rind, I'm using the zest and the juice, right, of a citrus, a piece of citrus. I'm using the root and the stem of a beet or or something. Um, if I'm shucking corn, you know, where you take the corn cob and you run your knife down it, then you turn the back of the knife and squeeze all the milk out, right? Like there's just like all the parts of the plant are lending to that overall sensory experience. It's going to make the food good. Um, and so I think anytime you're tuned into that the recipe will turn out better. The other thing I wanted to say was just thinking about texture, thinking about varying texture in food um, is something that everybody almost unanimously, even if they don't consciously think it, agrees makes foods better, right? So little pieces and big pieces, something smooth and something crunchy, you know? Um, and so just thinking about that when you go into um, Make whatever it is, whether you're making a casserole or you're making jar of sauerkraut, just how you're cutting it and what you're adding. Um, and then the final thing, which is like the 11th thing that I thought of at the end, um, if I'm making a pastry of any kind and it's calling for me to cut in fat, such as butter or something, hands down one of my favorite things to do, take that butter and grate it on a box grater instead of sitting there and cutting it and then working it in with your hands. So it's gonna instantly, not only it's gonna keep your hands from getting messy, it's gonna give that fat more surface area and it's gonna distribute way more evenly throughout the flour and the liquid and you'll get a beautiful pastry. You're gonna want result. that butter to be very cold, but you do anyways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yeah. do anyways if you're cutting it. It's not very cold, it's gonna smear and it wouldn't have worked that well. So you, want so you keep your unsalted butter frozen? No, I just keep it in my fridge. Okay. So. Whereas I keep some in the freezer too, just mm -hmm. because. A lot, a lot I of people a keep it. Backup. A lot of people do. So it's fine. Yeah. My freezer is a bit. It's a bit full. It's a little more full than it should be. Yeah, that's what freezers <laughs> are, right? That happens. Yeah. Okay, so I actually don't do what Meredith does for um, pie crust. I use a food processor. And it's, well, I don't use a food processor a lot because I don't like cleaning them. That's why I don't use it for pie crust. <laughs> it's actually pretty easy for pie crust though. Yeah. Um, and I can actually use no other bowl. Yeah. So it kind of justifies it. So I just chop up big chunks of the butter, toss them in with the flour, and pulse it watching carefully. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see the motion. You can see when it's ready. It, may, it starts to make streams the way it's pulling it. 
and then it's done. And then I just tend to add a little bit of water I need in there, hit it once or twice more, take it out, I'm ready to put it on the, on the um, board and start to shape it up to roll it. That's another great, another great use of the food processor is for sifting dry ingredients if you're baking. So if it's calling, because I, I think you probably got that I don't love single-use kitchen gadgets. I don't need a sifter. I don't need a garlic a press. Room, <laughs> I just can't handle them. It's like, what's the point? You know, so we're going to go over different ways to mince garlic in a second to get rid of that garlic press. And um, I don't like sifters, even though they're quaint and cool. I might put it on a shelf, but you just take a fine mesh sieve and knock your, you know, flour through there. But another thing you can do if you're making like a sponge cake or something where it's just really essential for you to have your dry ingredients sifted, go ahead and mix them all up as you would for making a cake anyway, you know, your cinnamon, your flour, your baking soda, whatever. Put them all in the food processor and just whir them around and they'll be all nice and uniform and very fine. Same with powdered sugar. You can just take sugar and put it in a coffee grinder or a food processor and powder it, <laughs> right? Something I also would use it for sometimes, though it depends. If I'm really in a hurry, I do it another way, which I'll tell you in a minute, but if I want my nuts chopped up to a certain size, it takes a long time to chop another thing. And what I hate is them flying off the board. You know what you can do? Key things from flying off the board? Put a little salt down. Oh, okay. It's awesome. Plastic bag and then have a big that's what, that's what I do. Do that. Put in a plastic bag. Crunch them up. Yeah, bags. that works yeah. really well. That's a lot. But better. that's great for herbs, like to keep them from flying off the board. You just throw a little salt down and then chop, and they're not flying I'll everybody. There. I'll be there on that. All right, that cool, works. good. <laughs> I'm glad. Then you can collect the salt later, and you've got herb salt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Super good. Yeah, it's got a little oils in it, probably. I just love roasted peppers. Yeah. And you know, they, just, they just add, like especially things like pasta salads and stuff like that, where you're experiencing the more, less important in a, in a dish like a soup or something. But if it's a pasta or someplace, you can just really ramp up the flavor. And so my way of doing it is ideally have gas stove, which I do in Silo, Mills River, I have to put it in the broiler of my toaster oven. But I get them to totally blacken and blister, throw them in the freezer for a couple minutes, mm -hmm. then underwater. The skin separates. Yeah, it just comes mm -hmm. right off really fast. Yeah. You know, the hardest part's cleaning the bottom of the sink out, which isn't that hard if you got a little drainer. Right. And so then you can do that. And by the way, you can then, if you want to make a, have a mess one time, you can make a bunch, put them in olive oil, but keep them refrigerated. Mm -hmm. Don't let them sit out. They're not going to keep very well sitting out. Small chance of botulism. Not as great since you've roasted them, but oil and vegetable matter is a setup for botulism. Yes, it is. So if you keep it refrigerated, no problem. And then you've got those peppers, you can use them anytime you want. Which makes me think that we should talk about cooking pasta really quick before we go to knives because a lot of people put oil in their pasta water to keep the noodles from sticking, but that's also going to keep the sauce from sticking to the noodles. So what you want is salt in the water to keep the noodles from sticking together. And also once you've finished, this, my ex-husband used to always say, why are you running water over the pasta when it's cooked? It's just going to be watery. I'm like, you have to run cold water over it when you decant it into the colander to stop the cooking so you don't get overcooked mushy pasta. And then you should take a little bit of the cooking liquid and save it, put it back on the, on the pasta that's cooked, or take a lot of it and save some for your starter. Like Pat was saying, you can take a little bit, put it on the noodles, and it's going to give it more adherence to the sauce. It's a no-fail trick. Great trick. Starch. Starch. Yeah. Um, okay. So getting quicker with your knife without being... Uh, dangerous. <laughs> um, and so we have a pro knife skills video up if you want the whole class of different chopping te techniques, etc. I urge you to check it out. But the two things I find when I teach those types of classes that people don't know most is how to hold your knife and also how to hold your holding hand. And so I just wanted to show you guys that really quickly. When you hold your knife, I find people out here where you have no control and you're very likely to chop your own finger off. You want to hold your knife, this is the spine, and this is the handle. You want to pinch across part of the back of the spine as well as the handle. Um, and then if you're pushing, push with your thumb. If you push with your finger, you're going to eventually get bone spurs. So put, this is the thumb grip, this is the pinch grip. The other thing about, you want to keep vegetables as flat as possible on the bottom, and that's going to prevent it from rolling and you hurting yourself. But your holding hand, the way I like to describe it is almost like it's in a sling, but you want to hold it like it's in a sling and you curl your fingers up. You don't want to be holding it like this where you can chop your fingers. You want to keep kind of an angle and then you're using the flat part of the top of your knuckle as a guide for your knife. And then you can get very thin 
slices if that's what you want, just by backing your holding hand up. And their knife should always be going forward and down, right? Unless you're doing a back chop, in which case it's going back and down. But that fluid motion forward and down and the holding hand in the proper position is going to vastly increase your speed um, with your knife. And resist the temptation to then take the knife and scrape the board. If you want to scrape, you scrape the back backside. Mm -hmm. that'll, that'll dull your knife very quickly. Right. And then the other thing is absolutely using, yep, a lot of people do. Your honing steel, if you don't have one of these, get one. I'm going to start giving them out in the street, is what I always say, because they're that important. This knife, even though you can't see it, is made up of tiny little teeth, just like a serrated blade. And as you're using your knife, or banging it around, or whatever, or getting fat on it, it's, those little teeth are either getting gummed up or they're getting bent out of alignment. And this honing steel is just going to bend those little teeth back into alignment. When we sharpen our knives, we're actually taking metal off which is gonna wear on the knife over time. So we wanna hone every time we use a knife and sharpen maybe once, twice, four times a year, depending on how much you use it. But having a sharp knife and knowing how to use it is essential, I think, to speed and efficiency. Um, also understanding that the way you chop the vegetable is gonna affect how quickly it cooks and you know how it cooks, right? So a lot of people don't know that if you, if you cut with the grain of the cells, like for example, take a bell pepper. If you cut that bell pepper in half, you look at how the grain is going up and down. If you cut with the grain, it's going to cook faster than if you cut across that grain. Um, and obviously, the smaller the piece, the faster it's going to cook through, et cetera. Um, so just thinking about that, not only when you're thinking about texture, but just thinking about the quality of the end product. Sharp sure. knife is safer. Is That's that right. right. Mm -hmm. By far. Yeah. By far. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell me, on your chef's knife, do you have it? Is it 30 degrees or 15 degrees? Well, it depends on the knife. And if you have a nicer knife, you can usually look on the maker's website and it'll tell you how your knife is beveled. So he's speaking to the degree at which it's beveled back from the edge. And that determines the degree of sharpness and also the degree to which you should be holding it when you hone it or sharpen it. Most knives, knives are beveled at 20 degrees, 15 to 20 degrees. So when you're setting, and this is by far the safest way to learn how to hone, is by putting the honing steel down like this. If this is your 90 degree, this is your 45, this is about your 20. So you're going to go in the direction of the sharp blade down on both sides. And that's all you do to hone. And as you get faster, you can pick it up and you can do it different ways. This knife, I believe, is beveled a little bit more acutely um, than a traditional knife. Um, and you'll find some that are, you know, 10 degrees Mm -hmm. seven degree, you know, whatever. Um, so maybe you look into your knife a little bit. But if you've got a standard, you know, just like an OXO or like a, um, I don't know, the white handle ones, I forget them. Yeah, it's going to be probably 20 degree bevel. Um, and by the way, if you just don't think you're getting any response from your um, steel, how old is it? They wear out. They do. Yeah. I use my sense of hearing for this. Like when I hear it go kind of shing, shing, shing off the end, I feel like that it feels good. You can also just take it off and try it. And if you feel a marked difference in the way it's cutting, you know it's properly honed, you know. But the more you wear down on a knife without honing it, <laughs> you probably need to sharpen and then proceed honing. And a lot of people say, oh, well, I'll put, I was cutting up some meat for somebody in a demo. And they were like, you just picked up your honing steel while you were cutting and honed it. I said, oh, yeah, all throughout the process. You have this there. Like and he's like, so you're going to have to wash that. Yes, I'm going to wash this just like I wash my knife. You know, it's not something I use, you know, just before I pick up the knife and I leave it way over there and then I go do my thing and come back. Like, I'm, you know, as I'm using it, if I feel it dulling, it needs to hone. Do you sharpen your own knife? I do. Uh -huh. I use a Japanese water stone. And we have an oil stone here, and Pat's going to talk about care and maintenance of that stone in a little bit. If you, um, I don't use a grinder or electric sharpener. I think you certainly can. But I find that some of the cheaper electric sharpeners are a great way to wreck your blade. Um, and so I just like to do it the old fashioned way. It takes time, and definitely, to use a stone. You've got to really spend some time sharpening. Um, and I'm just now sort of getting to that zen like place where when I have to sharpen my knives, I'm like, oh, God, I have to sharpen my knives, you know? Um, but, but yeah. <laughs> uh, the one point, which I haven't ever set down for you to try, but. The person who gave us this knife and some other very good knives, these are very good knives, also gave us a set of two straps, one leather mm -hmm. and one actually like 
nylon or something. Yeah. And those, you can really get that edge even sharper. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so you could take it to where, you know, maybe you would then not use this as much and those times sure. in between you would go to the leather. Right, and they, and, and in olden times they would put the leather on their belt and then mm -hmm. pick it up and just That makes down. a lot of sense, mm -hmm. yeah. I got it on a drawer at the house right now mm -hmm. and I can do that much more than I do the steel. And it'll wear just like a steel will mm -hmm. as well. You know, I've seen them in antique stores, like old sharpening leathers and they're just Tina. beat. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. just beat. Yeah. Uh, but they're cool. <clears throat> um, okay, so... Garlic, I find a lot of people don't use fresh garlic in it. It makes me wiggle. Because um, I think fresh garlic is like one of the best things in the world. Well, and an important point, if you also don't like the taste of powdered garlic, Yana, who makes her own garlic powder and keeps it frozen, has figured out that's because it's usually rancid. Oh, totally. I'm just talking about like the minced garlic in water that like is in the jar that people buy so they can just like... But um, one of the things you can do is absolutely you can take and you can depaper a bunch of cloves and put them in a food processor and pulse them. You know, not too fine because, again, you don't want them to go bad faster. But then you can keep them in a little bin in your fridge. And then as you're cooking throughout the week, you don't have to go through the process of doing this. But also I find that instead of sitting here and, like, gunking up my fingernails trying to get this off, a lot of people don't know that you can just do this with the side of your knife and knock the paper off. The other thing you can do is... If you don't want the clove to be smashed at all, you can take the little butt end of that and just cut it off, and that generally gets it to where you can just pull the paper right off. If you're doing a lot of cloves, there's a trick where you can take, separate them off their little root and put them in a bowl, a metal bowl, and then get another metal bowl of equal size, put them together, take them outside, because it's messy, and then just shake them as hard as you can. Shake them, shake them, shake them, and then take the bowl off, and you'll see that the papers are just falling right off of them. And that's a lot, when I had my restaurant, that's what we would do, you know, was just do a whole bunch of garlic, shake them, and then put them in the food processor, pulse them up, and have I've them in the fridge. put them in something like a bag and roll them on a cutting board. That's too. true, yeah, it's rolling. Very, it's very just very like basically rubbing the papers off. Um, the other thing is, and, and this is, this is, goes back to knife skills, but if you're mincing garlic is an incredibly quick thing to do as long as you're proficient at doing it. And so what I do is I cut the clove in half, like I said, just to get everything as flat as possible. And then using that technique I showed you earlier, I can either cut paper thin slices for my recipe, or I can, once I've got those slices, so by the time it took me to get my garlic press out at this point, you know, load all the garlic in it, then go through that process of like picking all the garlic that got stuck in it and then rinsing it out before it all dries on there, I could have had the thing peeled and at least paper thin sliced. And then if I want it minced, I come back with my rock chop, which is just my holding hand on top of the blade. And I come in here and I just mince it up, you know? And in general, you don't, I mean, true mincing is like pretty equal size pieces, but in general, you don't necessarily have to do that, right? You just need it in small pieces for your recipe. That amazes me. I'm always cutting myself, so. <laughs> well, it's just practice, you know what I mean? And, and, getting, and getting that whole right. drain. The way that you can't cut yourself. That's right. The and then you just dump it in the, in the pan. And, and in general, I find people add garlic like this way too early in the cooking process. It's gonna either burn or it's just gonna not taste like anything. If you want the garlic flavor, add it towards the end. And, and a lot of recipes will say, saute the onions and garlic until, you know, whatever. And it's like, well, you need to put the onions in well before you've put the garlic in if you really want that flavor um, there. Uh, so we did peeling garlic three ways, mincing garlic two ways. Question? Put the garlic in at the end? Do you mean at the very end of the Well, I guess it depends. If you want really, really strong garlic flavor, put it in at the end. But just putting it in later than most recipes call for, I think. And you can, based on what you're making, you can kind of tweak that based on how much you want garlic flavor in it. Instead of buying a roasting rack, just put sliced or cut onions under whatever you're roasting and let the juices drip down onto them. So the onions are gonna elevate that product up so that the heat gets all around it. But then you're also gonna be able to roast some delicious onions in the juices of whatever flavorings you've seasoned with. And then you can deglaze that pan always. and you can chop up those always, onions always, and make always, an awesome yeah. sauce or gravy always. for whatever it was that you're roasting. No need for roasting racks. The other thing is egg separators drive me insane. You can separate an egg in your hand. You 
You just crack it, peel the top off, dump it in your hand, hold the yolk and let the white run through. Easy peasy, then dump your yolk in, in your recipe or wherever else. If you are putting things in Ziploc bags and they're, the bags are falling over and you're pouring liquids, take that bag and put it inside a measuring cup and turn the ends up over the measuring cup. Not only, not only is it gonna hold the bag steady, but you're gonna be measuring what you're putting in so you know exactly how much stock or whatever your pancake batter you have left over and you can label it. Using Ziploc baggies to pipe frosting or mousse, just filling up the Ziploc bag and cutting the corner off rather than having pastry bags and tips, I think is a great way to minimize equipment. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to share was fresh herbs are like a huge like passion for me um, and so Obviously, if they're not making leaves in the winter time, then we need as many ways to preserve them as possible. Maybe we don't want to make pestos with everything, but what you can do is take the whole leaves washed and put them in stock or wine and freeze them in ice cube trays. And then you have fresh herbs in pretty, I mean, you can do it in water too, but it's better to have a more flavorful liquid and you can just pop those little cubes out and add fresh herbs all year also, long. You can also, go ahead. Can you grow herbs indoors in pots in the winter? Sure. That one? Yeah. You won't be as satisfied with the growth if you don't have some supplemental light. But that's not hard to do. A simple, like the shop lights that are pre-wired that you can plug in. Mm -hmm. You don't have to buy the fancy bulbs. You can simply get a warm bulb and a cool bulb. You want to keep it very close to the plants. You don't want it up high because it's not the sun. Uh -huh. So you just have it very close to the plants and leave it on a lot of the time. Uh -huh. And you'll get significant growth. Otherwise, in the winter, the growth is going to drop way off. So what kind of bulb do you get? You, you get a warm bulb and a cool bulb. And if you go to a hardware store and ask them, they'll help you figure that out. You know? mm -hmm. It's just they're, they're two ends of the spectrum of light. You get the full spectrum of both of them. Uh -huh. And it saves having to go out and buy a more expensive growing bulb. Mm -hmm. okay. you know? oh, thank you. Um, and so that's pretty easy to set up. You know? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, simply plug it in, and they have a place where there's like two little chains that you hook, and then you just have to have something to attach it to. And it's set up, so you know it doesn't take any building skills. Right? Good, thank yeah. you. How many people have not yet figured out how to be uncomfortable when they're chopping a lot of onions? Do y'all have that figured out? Do I not need to bother to tell you that? Put a glass of water there. Well, the easiest thing to do is to get a fan and have it blowing the stuff away from you. That's true. That's the easiest way to do it. Another trick is to refrigerate the onions and have them good and cold. Some people put them in the freezer just briefly before they chop them. Um, I am convinced that they bother you more the more dehydrated you are. I'm convinced. That makes sense. So if you're keeping yourself hydrated, they'll bother you less. And obviously certain onions are going to be more pungent than others. But it makes sense because the yeah. tears are what are getting that away. And so the more you can tear, the less you right. bother. Right, less is bothered. Yeah. Okay, and then I guess we, we should transition because we're running out of time over into cleaning and maintenance. Okay. Bec and just like, you know, to preface that, just having clean... Having a clean carafe for your coffee pot will make better coffee every morning, right? And the same principle follows for dishes and pans and stuff. So I'm gonna turn it over to Pat for that. For making a dressing, the easiest way to do it is set your blender in. And by the way, when you're done, you can put it in a jar like this, a small mason jar. And for most blenders, I check and be sure, you could then, if you're ready to serve it, if it's been sitting in the fridge and it has separated over a lot of time, go ahead and stick the blender bottom on this and stick it in and mix it right up again. So that makes it a lot easier. You don't have to get your thing dirty, the same jar you stored it in. You can screw the blender bottom yeah. onto the jar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But anyways, you get your blender set up. You have the um, top on with the little center out, and which is the only time I ever use this feature. Um, and you put in... Oh, and you're emulsifying? Yep. Yeah. You put in vinegar. Um, and my recipe is portions always, right? It's between a third and a quarter of the volume is going to be the vinegar. The third for me, for ratio. Yeah, yeah. it just depends on what I, which one I'm doing. Yeah. Sometimes I'll use water instead yeah. to make it even lighter. Um, anyways, you will thin it with more water if you, if you go on the quarter round. You put that in, you put any, any herbs that are still green and fresh that will macerate well with a very small amount of the vinegar, not too much. If you get too much vinegar in there, it's going to take forever them to, for them to chop it up. But enough that it's going to be a slurry, it'll quickly macerate it. And I just throw the garlic in then. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have to chop it. I toss yeah. it in there, right? I hit that on pulse until it's really slurried nicely, okay? If I've left some of the vinegar out, I add that in, okay? I tend to always add the water in last, though theoretically, scientifically, it's probably better to put it in next. At this point, I'm ready for the olive oil. At this point, before the olive oil, mustard. And mustard, the reason is, and you may not want mustard in the recipe, in which case, instead, 
you get your trusty herb grinder out and you grind up flaxseed. But one or the other, a tablespoon or two, put them in, and they're going to help it to emulsify and stay emulsified. Okay. So you add those in, then you add the olive oil when it's on running, not too high so it's not splashing, and you just pour it in at a steady stream and don't lose the emulsion. Um, the secret weapon, which I saved to last after I've adjusted the other flavors, so I would have, if I brought the blender, I would have tossed the herbs in here, blended them up, right? I also brought fresh herbs. They would have all gone into the bottom with the vinegar, except for a larger volume of parsley, which I used to taste. And parsley is my secret weapon as a cook. It's my favorite. There are several, and I'll quickly mention them. It's my favorite um, equivalent of monosodium glutamate. It actually is a flavor enhancer. It actually brightens flavors, makes them stronger, and even more powerfully for me, it blends them. Mm -hmm. So if you've got something that just isn't coming together, you put a bunch of parsley in, blend it up so you get a lot of surface area. So you're releasing a lot of the oils and stuff, and you're there. For that use, even though Italian parsley is basically considered culinarily better, you're better off with sweet parsley mm -hmm. or curly parsley because you're just going to blow people away with the aromatic oils of that parsley. Mm -hmm. So for that big volume use, you go back to the curly parsley. So I'll pour the oil in until I like the emulsion. Then I'll taste it, you know, decide how much salt and pepper to put in. I do that to taste. Then I'll taste it again, and I almost always want to add parsley to get those flavors to come together. So most of my dressings are brownish, greenish, because I put a lot of parsley in them. Yeah. Can you do the uh, dressing without a blender? Could you yes. As a matter of fact, if we had more time, I would have oh. made this right here in this jar. Vigorous shaking. Right, right. If you don't get that idea of being able to stream the oil in, you could have a little whisk and spin it. Whisk, yeah. But if you really shake the heck out of it and you have the emulsifier in there, it's going to work pretty darn well. If you have a stick blender, like an immersion blender, you can, you can put all your ingredients in the jar and just put the blender down in there and just whir it up and it emulsifies really well. Put an immersion blender in a jar. Yeah, and, you, and I was giving a class last weekend in Kansas and somebody told me that's how they make their mayonnaise, which is great because when you think about making emulsifications, what you're doing is you're forcing two things that are not normally soluble to dissolve into each other, which is why you have to pour the oil in so slowly that you feel like you're gonna die, right? <laughs> but there are other ways to really force that, that, um, those two things to dissolve together. Since your class is about doing more with less mm -hmm. gadgets and all, I'm thinking of doing away with my blender. I don't do those drinks, so yeah. could I do everything that you all are talking about without a blender? Yeah, shake it up. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. yeah, you just have you like to work harder things. at it, that's all. <laughs> Pardon? You just have to work harder at it. Or whisking, I mean, Whis vigorous yeah, whisking yeah. and then pouring the oil in that way. Is that I've right? definitely made dressings that were just as good as blender dressings without the blender. I just didn't have a blender. I wasn't in a situation okay. where I had a blender and I could okay. still make a great dressing. Thank you. Okay, so then we'll go to cleaning and care. The first one is stones. I'm just going to pass these around. This stone I've had for years, and it's looked and felt like this stone, because if you use an oil stone, even if you try and clean it off, I've got one side clean, but I didn't have enough um, club oh, soda to clean wow. the other side, you know? Yeah. So it's just like really, you know, been a long time before it got clean. You can just see, maybe I'll hold them. This has basically got tons of oil in it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and part of the look of this is because it got some club soda, so it kind of smeared, but it wasn't enough to take it off. So how, I just went into a, a restaurant store, which, by the way, is where I got a garlic, a garlic press that solves all of our problems because it's this big and the holes are big. Oh, and I could throw it in without taking the skins off. So well, I just pop the whole thing through. Aren't you special? Yeah. <laughs> well, I am because that store is long closed in Scranton, PA, and I have not been able to find a garlic press like right that on. anywhere. You know? It also has a nutcracker and an olive pitter on it. Oh, well, then it's not single use. <laughs> it passes the test. Right, yeah, right. So anyway, this is, you know, you can't really sharpen a knife on that. It's too slick. It's just saturated with oil, you know. But this here is fine. This is actually the coarser side, more like that. Which one is the water one? Which one's Neither the of these are water. These are both oil stones. Oh. This is one that I purposely saved, messed up, that I didn't clean, just so I could show you the difference, okay? So this has been cleaned with club soda. I went into the store, I said, how do you get the oil out of a stone? The guy said, club soda. Mm -hmm. I've never read it anywhere, I don't know, but it's just a tip. Yeah. You just soak it in club soda, and then you come back, and you can just scrub the oil right off. Club soda will get, get us out of wheat colored jeans, too. Huh. Cool. Okay. Or wine. So the other cleaning tips that I was going to mention is, I don't know who taught me this one, but some, somebody in my cooking career, you burn a pan really bad, you just can't figure out how you could possibly save it, mm -hmm. you boil it with baking soda and water. Oh. And it just releases it. Just comes it. right off. Yeah. You may need to come in and finish it up if it's terrible with something like Bon Ami, which is a oh, non-scratching yeah. cleanser, but the bulk of the cleaning. And indeed, I had this pan that I kind of burned, 
and it would have been hard to clean in front of you. And I thought, okay, I'll just boil it with the baking soda, bring it in the shower, use it clean, but everything lifted off. I couldn't, there was no oh, use wow. bringing it up. It just cleaned it without doing anything. <laughs> it was not so it wasn't burned that you bad. You don't make a paste with baking soda and water. You just put water and baking soda yeah, and Yeah, and I, you know, I thought, recipe, I don't have a recipe. I just dump it in there. But if you, yeah. if you need a recipe, I'd say something like no more than two cups of water to a quarter cup of baking soda. And, you know, if you're going to go to more than you have. And I will sometimes, depending on what space I have, will save that as my pan cleaning solution because the baking soda doesn't change. Mm. So it'll look black and ugly. <laughs> Well, you can use it again. At a certain point, I get tired of looking at it and throwing it out. <laughs> Cast iron. Years ago, I got I read the directions, and it said to lightly coat it with oil and then put it in a low oven and leave it in there for a long time. kind of works, but it kind of makes this sticky, you know. Yeah, it makes it sticky. Yeah, it's not really cured. And then finally, I bought a pan from the right company, and they said, lightly coat it 500 degrees. Yeah. 500 degrees. Then it actually makes a Talk surface. To it. it actually, like... It's on there, and it's not coming off without a lot of abuse, mm -hmm. you know. Now, for me, I would only do that in the summertime with the windows wide open. Yeah. It's, but what it's I can do is... smoke a lot. Instead, is I have a wood stove in Sila. Mm -hmm. So I just have to use my infrared thermometer, make sure that it's 500 degrees in those coals, stick it in there, boy. When I have that, it's a couple times a year I notice the coals are just right. I grab all the pans, oil them up. That's awesome. Stick them in there. <laughs> yeah. Get them cured. Right. You know? mm -hmm. Well, if it's in the wood-fired stove, I just leave it there till nighttime, and I'm going to start the fire again. But if it was in the oven... Probably half an hour, something like that. Half an hour at mm -hmm. the most, you know, you maybe less. You did the first thing, and you got the stickiness. Yeah. Can you then, without doing anything else, do the other and go to five hundred, and it'll? You out? might add a little bit more oil because you've lost some of that. But yeah, you can just you can you don't have to clean that other stuff off. It'll also okay. just like you know yeah. okay. become part of the pan. Yeah. <laughs> it basically is. It's like a glaze, you know. Yeah. You know, I used to to. Um, your mind just on top of the stove mm -hmm. and just leave them till they were really hot and you could you could see how yeah. that was then turn it off and just leave it in and they were fine yeah. you never put it in the oven right mm -hmm. but I can see where putting it in the oven might but you need that high heat to get that effect yeah okay and that's going to be smoky it's going to be smoky mm -hmm. yeah the only thing I wanted to share is something I like just found in a very, very old recipe book. If you have a ceramic or glass or porcelain dish or bowl that's cracked, not like cracked in two, but it's starting to get a crack through it and you really want to save it, boil it in milk and it fixes it. I have no idea why. And I found it in this really old recipe book and I was like, that's not going to work. And then lo and behold, I had this like, you know, dish that was cracked and I was like, I'm going to try that. And I just boil it. I don't know. It's cracked. How do you put the milk in and boil it? Well, I'm just putting it in a bigger pot oh, and bo and like letting the milk kind of scald around it. Oh, yeah. And I, yeah, just like sweet. It said sweet milk in the old, old recipe. So just like regular milk. And I didn't know how long to do it. I just did it until it was like good and hot and it made like a nice scalded milk all over the pot. And I took it out and washed it. And I was like, I'm going to try it. until so I tried making something in it and it was perfectly fixed. Oh my God. So... It doesn't go away, but it's like seals it in this way that it was just miraculous. It could be. Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's not, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust cooking with any of the number of glues that you could use to fix something. Totally, right? And, but this is just milk. And I've done it with cereal. I've done it with countless cereal bowls since that, you know, just a little cereal bowl that's cracked. And you just put it in the milk, boil it. It's all fixed. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Never. <laughs> That's hacking. Yeah. <laughs> right on. I'm glad you think so. <laughs> I think that's all we have. Yeah, Do you have any other questions or? Mm-hmm. Thanks for coming.